the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, but before that, for some three decades, I was a BBC foreign correspondent uh, and news anchor. Uh, and we're here discussing in this workshop today the question of the safety of online media actors and what can be done uh, to improve the safety of online media actors. This is a joint open forum which has been proposed uh, by the European Broadcast Union, the Council of Europe, the OSCE and UNESCO in cooperation with the governments of Austria, the Netherlands, Sweden, also with the IFJ, the RSF and uh, other organizations too. It's a great pleasure to have you all here today. Let me just set the scene by saying something very simple. That is that when I was a BBC foreign correspondent, often traveling into countries which were immensely difficult, often carrying out investigations which were immensely difficult, what gave me protection as a television correspondent was the fact that my organization was very well known and it would have been a very foolish government that moved against uh, the BBC very openly or threatened a BBC correspondent very openly. It would have been very dangerous for a government to do this. No such protection, of course, is available for online bloggers. They do not have the protection of a large organization behind them, uh, and therefore what we're discussing here is how best to protect these people and to guarantee the, their safety when they are not uh, protected by large organizations. And we have a number of sessions today which will examine that. What uh, we also probably need to look at is in the anarchy of the internet, <clears throat> is that a protection for people? Uh, or does that give people who might oppose bloggers uh, room to exploit the anarchy uh, in, order to, in order to move against them? Is it a question of laws that are required? Uh, or is it a question of implementation of existing laws? All our speakers will be looking today uh, at what can be done and why this is such an important area. And you don't need to be told just how fast this is a growing area of the media. Uh, I noticed today that, uh, for example, on Twitter, the American election results uh, is the most tweeted item ever in the history of Twitter. Uh, and in fact, uh, Barack Obama used Twitter to announce his victory first. Uh, he did not use the traditional media, and then that tweet became the most retweeted in Twitter history uh, within minutes. So I think it shows just how fast the online stage is moving uh, and why something needs to be done. I'm going to start by asking uh, Niels Musniak from the uh, Council of Europe, the Commissioner for Human Rights, to, to say a few words and to set the scene for where we are today. Niels. <coughs> Is this working? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. It's a great pleasure to be in Azerbaijan for the first time, and I hope that this will be the beginning of an intimate relationship where I will come regularly to address human rights issues in this country. Uh, I'm particularly pleased to be here to discuss uh, internet and freedom of expression uh, and the safety of online uh, media actors. This is a topic that I think will be uh, very important in the coming years. Uh, and I intend to address it in, in many, if not all, of the 47 member states of the Council of Europe. Um, in recent years, online media actors have received the most prestigious human rights awards in the world. Uh, the Nobel Peace Prize, the Sakharov Prize, uh, the UNESCO Guillermo Cano World Press Freedom Prize, and this is no accident. I think it reflects the rise of the online world, which is no longer a virtual world. It is the main public space for developing democracy, not only in places like Azerbaijan, but I think increasingly throughout the world. Uh, this, the rise of this online world, which is still, the contours of which are, are still quite vague, I think uh, presents new opportunities, but also challenges and, and many risks uh, for human rights advocates. I think we, it's clear that the internet is critical for freedom of expression, uh, social media, have played an, an absolutely essential role uh, in terms of uh, ensuring uh, freedom as, of association and freedom of assembly. They mobilized human rights activists and, and watchdogs uh, in many countries. Uh, at the Strasbourg World Forum uh, for Democracy a couple of weeks ago, Mikhail Zigar, uh, the editor of an independent Russian TV channel, argued that social media was actually building civil society in Russia. Uh, but at the same time, the openness of the inter internet uh, has been manipulated and obstructed 
uh, through various measures, including blocking, filtering, monitoring, uh, and other means. Uh, many bloggers and online media activists have been threatened and prosecuted. Uh, I met several of them yesterday in Kurdakani. Uh, and this is true not only in this country, but in many countries. Um, I think we need to rethink the governance of this new public space to ensure the human rights of internet users uh, and the safety of online media actors. Now, the Council of Europe, which is a Europe-wide uh, forum uh, to create uh, a common democratic and legal area, I think is pretty well placed to make a good contribution in this effort, of course, in cooperation with our partner organizations. <clears throat> but I think the, the Council of Europe has a special niche in this endeavor. Um, first of all, because we have the legal standards uh, embedded in the European uh, Convention of Human Rights and the, European, and the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. And the, the European Convention protects the physical integrity of online actors through the prohibition of torture, inhuman or degrading treatment, uh, as well as the rights to liberty, uh, security, not to speak of the right to, the right to life. It protects free expression uh, and association uh, in the Internet as well. Uh, now, the European Court of Human Rights has recognized the role of the Internet in, in enhancing access to news and facilitating the dissemination of information, and it has concluded that states have a positive obligation to create an appropriate regulatory framework to ensure journalists' free expression uh, on the Internet. Uh, the Council of Europe has also adopted several specific standards uh, applying to the Internet. Uh, in March of this year, uh, the Council of Europe adopted its Internet Governance Strategy uh, to, protect, to protect and promote human rights, the rule of law, and democracy online. This strategy is to be implemented over the next four years, uh, from 2012 to 2015, in cooperation with all stakeholders, with uh, the private sector and civil society as well. Uh, by the way, <coughs> I, I was approached by several civil society actors at this event uh, who reported that they had tried to contribute their country knowledge and expertise uh, in this event through information uh, that they had prepared, they wanted to distribute, and were not permitted to do so. And I think that we have to remind ourselves that protecting freedom of expression uh, is a joint endeavor for all of us, uh, for civil society, for international organizations, and for national governments. Uh, as the Commissioner for Human Rights in the Council of Europe, I've identified uh, the internet and uh, internet and human rights as a priority theme. Uh, when monitoring the 47 uh, member states, uh, I intend to pay particular attention to the openness and safety um, of the internet. I want to assist member states in complying with their obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights uh, so that they refrain from violating the rights of online actors, uh, protect the physical integrity and right to liberty and security, by preventive measures and adequate and an adequate legal framework, uh, and very importantly, uh, in, to combat impunity, to investigate uh, and provide effective remedies for people who have suffered ill treatment. Uh, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done to raise the awareness among governments about the special role of journalists in a democratic society, and that violence and intimidation against the media, uh, and in, particularly impunity, uh, is uh, one of the worst forms of censorship, as my colleague Dunja Mijatovic has, has written uh, on many an occasion. Uh, and we met uh, several people uh, who, uh, who have not had their cases examined, who, in which violence against them has not been pursued and investigated in an open, transparent manner. And I think that this uh, needs to be done uh, in order to uh, combat impunity and, and, and to take the chill off freedom of expression uh, in many countries. Um, the existing standards can contribute uh, to our work, uh, but I, I, I think it's problematic to just apply traditional approaches to the Internet. I think we need to, uh, to work to a, uh, towards a human rights compliant approach and define how existing standards need to be adapted uh, to the specific context uh, of online reality, uh, particularly regarding data protection, uh, protection of sources, tracking, surveillance, um, how the specific context requires us to adapt our, our standards and, and, and guidance. Um, and to what extent is this relevant for the safety of online media actors and what role uh, can international organizations play in updating uh, guidance on these issues? Uh, should 
protection or special protection be granted uh, <clears throat> that is generally granted to journalists, for example, on protection of sources or protection in situations of conflict, should this apply to online media actors as well? Uh, if they're working in the public interest, as they often are by stimulating public debate, um, exposing maladministration, corruption, can they be denied the protection uh, that journalists generally uh, receive or should receive uh, in such contexts? Uh, another topic, I think, is the link between the safety of media actors and the protection of the Internet itself uh, as an open space for freedom uh, to receive and impart information. Doesn't the safety of online media actors depend on privacy uh, on the Internet and how can we work to maintain it? Can safety be achieved uh, without subjecting surveillance, tracking, etc., to strict requirements of proportionality and judicial oversight? And how can we achieve this uh, in countries where it's not happening? Uh, what is the role of anonymity uh, to the extent that it exists uh, in securing safety? Uh, these are some of the questions I hope that we can discuss today, and I will stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we've been joined by Neely Crows, the EU Commissioner. I will give her a minute to settle down and uh, get her breath and uh, turn now to, we were hoping to speak to the President of the European Broadcast Union uh, to hear from him today. Sadly, he is not well and has been unable to join us, but uh, here also here from the EBU is Giacomo Mazzoni, who will now make an intervention on behalf of the EBU. Yes, now it's all okay. Perfect. Um, uh, Jean-Paul Philippot is sorry to not to be with you today, but uh, what is important is that this event take place. Uh, as you remember, uh, EBU was here in May for the Eurovision Song Contest, uh, and we promise at that occasion that uh, we will not forget the problem that has been ar arising around the event. Uh, so we are here back in order to reflect how better we can uh, improve the situation in this country, how uh, this could be improved through the relationship with the institution and uh, with the professional bodies that uh, insist in this field. Um, Azerbaijan is one country that uh, is in transition to democracy, uh, is a long process, and uh, we have uh, a certain experience uh, in that and around the table we gather other people and other institutions that uh, uh, could do the same job and we are here in order to uh, try to identify what are the best solution. Um, you would wonder why broadcasting world is interested in the online. Uh, the, there are a number of reasons uh, that uh, is easy to explain. The first is that the broadcasting world is moving towards the online the second is that, uh, as probably you are aware, most of the broadcasters, the national broadcasters, are also the, among the main uh, provider of uh, um, uh, contents for the for the internet. We don't call it content; we call programs or news or whatever, because content is very reducing approach to the, to the problem. But um, we are among the first provider of information, the first source, and the, one of the most reliable source uh, in the internet world. So for us, what happens in this world is important, uh, especially for certain countries where um, we cannot rely on um, official information, we need to rely on other sources, and the internet and the online world is one of the main sources for that. Uh, this creates a, a supplementary burden for our journalists in the newsroom to double check uh, what uh, comes from the user-generated content, but we see that more and more in some certain countries, this is the only way to get information. Uh, in Syria, if you look at Syrian case, where it's impossible for any foreign correspondent to be there in a safe condition, uh, two-thirds of the information come from the internet. And the problem there is the reliability and how to check and how to inform. So we, we need to act soon in enhancing the protection for uh, journalists that could act not only in, in country at war, but in normal countries where difficult situation arise, to have the uh, standards of protection enhanced uh, and not to be penalized because they are online journalists and not journalists uh, on the traditional media. 
Uh, and also in some countries we experience that also this journalist, these figures on the field um, sometimes have problem and conflict to be recognized even b within the profession. Uh, the, 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 the normal union, uh, the standard union of the traditional media, sometimes they don't recognize, they don't extend the level of protection that they have also to, to um, this new uh, actor of the internet world. Uh, that's a phenomenon that is very well known by UNESCO, for instance, that has made a specific recommendation on that. Uh, OSHA and Council of Europe has, has done a lot. So we gather all these people around, uh, hoping that then we have some messages to convey to those that uh, could uh, let these messages here by the uh, authorities, the concerned authorities of the national states. Thank you, and I wish a very fruitful conversation. Giacomo, thank you very much indeed. Well, I'm delighted to say that uh, Nili Crows hopefully has caught her breath. She's with us as EU Commissioner and uh, European Commission Vice President. Nili. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it is a um, pleasure for me to be in your midst and to get a lot of food for thought. And um, after my start of this day, uh, having a meeting with the president of uh, this country, um, I'm uh, in the mood, so to say, to get uh, a lot of uh, food for thought from your side. Um, by the way, the European Union is not just a common market, and we are aware of that. Uh, and we are even more aware today than we were, so to say. Um, it is, by the way, also not just a garden, uh, a guardian of peace. It is a place of fundamental rights, um, uh, rights that we treasure, that we protect and assure for our citizens. And that, by the way, was recognized by um, the Nobel Prize uh, that uh, we uh, got, um, uh, anyhow, the announcement, uh, it's still not handover, but, um, and I'm not saying that there is still a fight between three presidents, but anyhow, the prize will be handed over to whoever. Um, an excellent ID All by, <laughs> <laughs> well, an excellent ID by one of my colleagues, but that's just between you and me, was to invite uh, from every member state a kit and then uh, saying it is about the past and here is the future and let's go on. I think that should be a marvelous idea, but I'm not certain that those three egos, uh, they are male, by the way, <laughs> so that, that they would take that one. Um, but quite serious, the Internet is not just a technology, and it was already mentioned. Um, uh, it's not just a space for business opportunities. It is a tremendous... Uh, um, uh, opportunity um, in several cases uh, that are at stake. And the internet, by the way, is the new frontier of freedom and is a new tool to exercise this freedom. The right to self-expression is safeguarded and championed by a free media. And because a free media guarantees a way to challenge authority and expose abuse of power. It ensures awareness and tolerance for other views. And that is what is fascinating and that should be yeah, in the midst of our way of uh, dealing with the internet. Um, so ensuring awareness and ensuring the tolerance for other views, if safeguards liberty and human rights then we are talking about main principles for a democracy. And in that respect, it's clear that journalists, bloggers, uh, activists, and human rights defenders are an instrument of democracy and holding up a torch to reveal acts of despotism. Let me give you just one example of how powerful the Internet can be. I anyhow was quite touched by that example. And I'm sure many of you had the same experience when they were seeing or were reading about the amazing story of Malala Yousafzai. 
for several years, that Pakistani girl has been blogging about life under Taliban tyranny and calling for the right to women's education. Could it be more clear and could it be more uh, to the point just asking for women's education? And when she started that exercise, she was 11 years old. Well, we are aware that that is really talking about a superior uh, personality. So a young girl with fierce, brave sense of justice is able to spread her story to the world. And that is fascinating too. So it's not only spreading her word in her local community, but it is all over the world, so to say. One young girl armed only with access to the internet, open internet, by the way, it is able to expose and challenge the Taliban. Give me another example that is so clear and so um, illustrating. The Taliban, by the way, were so scared of Malala. They attempted to assassinate her, but they failed, thanks uh, heaven. And that cowardly attempt to murder a 14-year-old girl won't silence her and it certainly won't silence her message. And that is the power of free speech. And that is, in just a nutshell, a world of um, um, expectations, what can be done. So it is the power of free speech that we should give the floor and that we should use. And we should indeed be aware how powerful this, um, this uh, instrument is. And that's how much we need it. Wherever it is, whether it is Pakistan, Egypt, or Syria, and sometimes closer to home, so to say, or here in Azerbaijan. Um, another excellent example, uh, Enula Fatuliyev, an, uh, Azir, an Azeria journalist. This is empty over here. Here, <laughs> yeah. sorry. And I, I first shake hands. That is, that is not only a coincidence, <laughs> but th this is just arranged, so to say. And um, you are not only an admirable person and with a lot of courage, you also are a winner of the 2012 UNESCO World Press Freedom Prize. Oh. Who can just mention that, that he has such a prize? You dare to speak to defend freedom of expression and um, you were impr uh, imprisoned for having done so, so also seen the other side of, uh, the, mm, uh, of the medal, so to say. In this very country, we see many arbitrary restrictions on the media. We see the exercise of free speech effectively criminalized. We see violent attacks on journalists, and we see activists spade on online violating the privacy of journalists and their sources. I condemn this. The restrictions must end. It's not acceptable, so to say. And attacks must be investigated and punished promptly, thoroughly, transparently. And the Azeri government had promised earlier this year, before the Eurovision Song Context, to ensure press freedom but the situation actually got worse after that. We are taking action to defend those human rights, both within the EU, openly criticizing member states where needed, and beyond. That was, by the way, one of my main uh, messages during uh, the meeting with the president, that um, I don't like to uh, attack other ones when your own family is not um, completely yeah, in line with what you are preaching. So we are active together with Parliament. Uh, we are active on um, several member states where also those type of, and perhaps not comparable, but anyhow where freedom of speech, freedom of um, just um, judging if uh, it is uh, making sense to um, 
to investigate and to punish an um, independent authority, so to say, if that is at stake. Our no disconnect strategy will help online activists use technological tools in their struggle for democracy, like by promoting technologies that help journalists avoid surveillance and safeguard their right to privacy, by providing funding to fight cyber censorship under the European Institute for Democracy and Human Rights, and by ensuring that EU companies are aware of the human rights implications of the technologies they sell. In more serious cases, using ICT export controls. But, ladies and gentlemen, most of all, I want those in power in Azerbaijan and elsewhere to know that these repressive restrictions on media freedom of whatever kind are unacceptable. Legally, unacceptable, members of the Council of Europe, Europe, including Azerbaijan, should follow the standards they have committed to. And I want to pass that message, not only here and not only this morning to the President of Azerbaijan, but to everybody that is involved in this whole uh, type of discussion. To deprive of human rights, not just journalists and bloggers, not just their sources, but the citizens who have right to know the truth is not acceptable. And it will not serve the economic growth of the country. A free internet, a free country, is also the path to a more prosperous future. Violations of media freedom don't stand alone. They are linked to failures in other human rights too, because a government that arbitrarily restricts the media is without doubt restricting other freedoms too. A government with nothing to hide would not fear people exposing the truth. So I welcome the discussion of today. Um, it underlines our determination and all of us to protect a free and open media. And I'm here to listen to you, to get the food for thought, and to learn what you think needs to happen. And I hope that between us, we can ensure that we keep alight this flame of freedom and fundamental rights in Azerbaijan, but also throughout the world. Thank you. Commissioner, many thanks indeed. very thought-provoking uh, intervention. Now we go to round table one, which is about internet-based media and safety of journalists. Uh, we're going to have a number of uh, speakers. Uh, Guy Berger from UNESCO uh, in a minute. Enola Fatalayev, who is here with us, who of course, as Nelly mentioned, is winner of the UNESCO 2012 award for the freedom of press. Uh, joining us remotely, we have uh, Jim Bumella, the uh, president of the International Federation of Journalists, and also Christian Muir, from the uh, Reporters Sans Frontières, uh, Reporters Without Borders organization. Uh, here with us we have Lionel Fear, uh, the Ambassador for Human Rights from the Netherlands, and Bill Etcherson, who is uh, Google's Head of Free Expression uh, for this region, for the EMEA region. Uh, so we welcome them, uh, but we start, and of course you'll have a chance to put some of your questions as well. Guy. Uh, thank you very much and greetings everybody. A key part of internet freedom is freedom of expression online. It's relevant to all online actors, but for UNESCO it's especially relevant to those who do journalism online, because journalism, whether it's online or offline, is a very distinctive form of exercising freedom of expression, and one that makes a unique contribution to society. We know all too well that the exercise of freedom of expression is not without danger. Over 500 journalists have been killed in the past decade, and in nine out of 10 cases, their murderers have gone free. According to the last biennial report of UNESCO's Director General, 62 journalists and media workers were killed last year. And the list has increased dramatically. This year, by November already, there were more than 100, from 62 last year to more than 100 already this year. There are new types of threats on the rise. They extend far beyond the conflict areas and they are often linked to non-state actors such as organized crime groups. The online realm is also not free of risks 
and there are dangers specific to this platform. Take, for example, hacking and destruction of media websites, illegitimate surveillance of e-communications, and jailings for online postings. Then there are email death threats. Most recently, for example, I heard in Pakistan, editors are receiving death threats from the Taliban for their coverage of Malala Yousafzai. Worse, of course, there are killings, there are murders of people doing journalism online. Now, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists, out of 50 of those journalists who were killed in the first half of this year, 17 of those 50 were online journalists. And according to Reporters Without Borders, 39 netizens and citizen journalists have been killed this year. The effect of these killings, which are the ultimate censorship of the individuals, individuals who are so exterminated, is to intimidate many others who make use of online communication platforms to, inter, in, to exercise their right to press freedom. It is a chilling, a chilling curb on their liberty to publish to an audience via the internet. In the online environment especially, UNESCO believes that there's a common interest in safety between the journalists who are based in media institutions and everyone else exercising freedom of expression on the internet, even those who do not uh, do journalism but merely contribute personal news and views. This common interest is because of the emerging forms of online censorship and attacks against freedom of expression do not only affect one constituency. Arbitrary blocking and filtering, criminalization of legitimate speech, jailings, unwarranted surveillance and violations of privacy, these are ills that are inflicted upon internet users at large. In addition, the work of the journalism professionals can only be at its best in terms of serving society when their sources are free of fear free of fear to provide information both online and offline, and when the sources are confident that their confidences can be safeguarded, not least when there are electronic records on a laptop, a server, or communicated via a cell phone. The audiences of online media should also be free to access and interact with the stories of journalists. It is in, this, it is in the light of these points that bloggers and other occasional contributors to journalism should be able to count on the solidarity of their professional media counterparts and vice versa. As I said, a key part of internet freedom is freedom of expression online and particularly by those who contribute journalism. For UNESCO, this is critical because our constitution mandates us to promote the free flow of ideas by word and image, both online and offline. Here are some of the ways in which we seek to do this that have relevance to the safety of online practitioners, practitioners of journalism. First, one of our priorities is to coordinate the recently developed UN Plan of Action on the Safety of Journalists and the Issue of Impunity. This plan is a way to reinforce our objectives by working in cooperation with other UN agencies, programs and funds, intergovernmental organizations, professional associations, NGOs and the media industry. We will be listening very carefully today to how the contributions can assist us in integrating the online safety components into this UN plan, particularly as we translate it into concrete action. Later this month, we will meet in Austria, courtesy of the Austrian government, for an to develop the implementation strategy for the UN plan. Our second act activity to protect the safety of online actors, and particularly those who, who pr uh, practice journalism, is to research and document the challenges and good practices related to this. Building on studies that we have already done about online uh, regulation, balancing freedom of expression, privacy, and so on, we are going to be launching an online study on safety in coming months, thanks to the support of the Danish government. We are also working on gender and, and safety, including online, uh, with support from Norway. And we will produce in November next year for the 195 member states of UNESCO a world survey in trends in freedom of expression and safety, including online safety. Ideas and information and contributions to this research are really welcome. Our third area is spreading awareness and bringing more actors on board. We strive to mobilize the public about this issue, for example, in our activities around World Press Freedom Day and also coming up the International Day to End Impunity on the 23rd of November. Also key is our encouragement of media and civil society to join the decision-making processes con con connected to internet governance that pertain to freedom of expression issues. We are working on partnerships with media professional organizations, including the IFJ, International Media Support, Open Society, to promote safety training for journalists worldwide 
including in journalism schools. Many other stakeholders can and do create awareness about all these issues and they provide training and we look forward to working closely with them as we move ahead on this. Fourthly, we work to support the 195 member states in ensuring that the laws related to the internet meet international standards. Of course, you all know this, I won't go into them. But beyond the legal frameworks to protect freedom of speech, there must be a true will to implement them. Therefore, UNESCO calls on our governments continuously to respect these principles in connection to the online and also offline expression, not least in regard to blocking and filtering surveillance, whether these are done directly or indirectly by government. In this way, we promote a context where journalism can be practiced without fear of censorship or reprisal, whether online or offline. Lastly, we note that in addition to showing respect for the international standards for protection of freedom of, of expression and keeping restrictions to a minimum, individual states can and should go further so that they also actively defend online freedom. This can mean encouraging their peers to show respect for international standards. It can also mean working with safeguards concerning intrusion to secure websites about, uh, against cyber attacks. Finally, it can include the development of policies concerning the sales of hardware and software to clients who use these tools to violate freedom of expression. Well, in conclusion, UNESCO believes that many stakeholders working together in these kind of ways that we, are, for example, are working can help ensure that the safety of journalists can be secured. The points I've covered in summary are building the UN plan of action, the research, the documentation, the awareness raising in the coalitions, the international standards res being respected, and defending online freedom of expression. The aim should be that cyberspace is able to be secured as a realm of maximum pluralism, and within this, a place where high quality use of freedom of expression, namely journalism, can freely function in order to, to fulfill its potential contribution to the benefit of democracy, development, and peace. Thank you. Guy, thank you very much indeed. And uh, now we're going to hear from Enola Fatalai. Maybe it's very interesting for all of the participants uh, to maybe research to study about the situation in Azerbaijan at first because <laughs> we're discussing the uh, situation in our country. Uh, uh, we're discuss uh, discussing the internet uh, in Azerbaijan. You know, it's uh, very difficult to imagine how a journalist works in a non-democratic country where state bodies' activity is not transparent and where the corruption has turned from problem into the system. Unfortunately, already in our country, corruption has turned from problem uh, into the system. In other words, uh, I'm confident that a Western journalist will be in no position to work under our circumstances. He will hardly say a truth risking his freedom or even life. He won't be able to carry uh, on a journalist inquiry for all state and private structures. Not that even the private sector in our country is under uh, the state control. Decline from uh, commenting information and collaborating with journalists. Not to mention the collaboration with media. In our country, uh, already, as you know, the uh, commercial information is conferred the same status as the state secret. And thank you very much. Uh, I would like to use the opportunity to say thank you very much to the Council of Europe, European Commission, and to OSCE, which uh, expressed the deep attitude, deep concern about the situation with the, uh, this legislation. In other words, if a journalist has information about a certain commercial companies belonging to a state servant, he has no right to verify or refute the fact. Since under the current legislation, a commercial company may decline from providing information about an owner of the company, how can a journalist continue his professional activity under such circumstances? That's a question. Account has to be taken of the fact that if your activity is disapproved by the government, <laughs> if you, in the opinion of the powers that be have exceed your authority in permissible criticism of the government, you may be arrested or charged with the most absurd accusations, starting from drug addiction to hooliganism, 
from terrorism to xenophobia, you risk being attacked at night in your doorway, stopped or shut down. Or your private life may become the point at heated and long debates in social networks. As we remember, for example, the uh, bad example of the Khadija Ismailo. In the other words, if a journalist of our country realizes his responsibility to the reader and start telling the truth, he's sure to face with mechanism of repressions. After, he, after this journalist has been repressed, the reader is likely to forget about him. I remember it in prison. He would shake his head, express his regret, and consign him to oblivion. It will last until a new journalist is repressed. For this reason, professional professional journalists is actually dying out in our country. Nobody is eager to become a journalist and risk his freedom and life. This profession is becoming utterly unpopular due to its extraordinary responsibility. It's the internet only that made it possible to shape a new media formation in our country. It's a people. It says civilian journalism. In other words, the journalism of our country has assumed importance of civilian responsibility. In my view, it's a sort of social anomaly or maybe a social phenomenon typical for purely authoritarian and totalitarian countries whose governments don't recognize the right of society to alternative point of view. In our country, any criticism of semi-official organ is reputed to be a challenge to the system. For instance, our 13 years of my media activity, I faced all kinds of repressions, including my four-year imprisonment. When I was released, many people asked me, why do you persist in continuing your activity? Why don't you give up? Why don't you uh, leave the country? I met with such questions uh, in terror of this building too. I realized that I am still in the ranks of journalism because there is no one I can shift of responsibility. Regretfully, our society doesn't realize that we are subject repressions not because of what we have written, said, or shut, because our society has read, heard, or watched. What we, pres what, what we present to its attention. Raising hopes in our soul is a new age of globalization and strengthening of internet and social networks impact in the life of society. The latter begins to share with us the responsibility of the lack of democracy. It's the internet that helps society into the democratic process, supplied it with the civilian and the failing of responsibility for country's future. In place of this uh, extinct, degraded, and corrupt professional journalism, there sprang up a new people's journalism. This journalism cannot be jailed, bribed, crushed, and closed. Its end is none other than people's voluntary renunciation of its own rights. Renunciation of civil responsibility may lead to the establishment of the kingdom of obscurantism of many decades. Alas, in a case like that, we are powerless. Thank you very much for attention. Hey, another thank you very much indeed for sharing that with us. Um, we have some discussants who might want to comment a little bit on uh, something they've heard in the past few minutes. Um, Lionel Thier, perhaps you might like to say a few words about the role of, of government in all this, because um, it strikes me that if you go on the internet as a blogger in many countries uh, where your rights are not protected, then you have to go in with your eyes open. You have to assume you have no protection. Uh, and that should be the starting point, uh, because many countries claim to have laws which protect online actors, but of course they either don't implement them or they use them in ways which can be detrimental to online actors. Um, you're probably going to have to come up here to, to speak, actually, because I don't think you've got a microphone. So it's not an attempt to silence you.
Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Yes, indeed. I think as a government who is very active on this, the Dutch government uh, is not alone, not only trying to promote this idea of, say, basically the, is the, the fact that we say whatever rights exist offline also have to be guaranteed online. And I think uh, we're trying to use these words safety, but basically we're talking about, uh, point to the opposite, we're talking about violations of human rights. And in that sense, sad to say there's nothing new in the world. Violations have been going on for decades, and the, in the online world this continues to happen. And we think on the one side we try to push freedom online, we form this freedom online coalition with countries who are trying to push this agenda forward on international fora, like in the OSCE, in the European Union, wherever we can, we try to push this agenda. But I think in this context of safety and protection, it's also important that we try to take on a very hands-on approach. Uh, so I think we invest a lot of energy, time and money in projects where we are actually trying to educate those journalists, online journalists, citizen journalists, how you want to call them, to better protect themselves, because there's one thing you can do also, and that's a very practical side, how can you protect yourself online, how can you make sure that it's not so easy to track you down and, and shut you up in a physical way by putting you in jail like happened here in uh, Azerbaijan. And the other sense, also we try to improve the quality, because I think the other argument of the site is that when you have online journalists, there's often a debate on uh, are they journalists? Uh, are they not just opinions uh, trying to do away with the information that is spread through the internet? And in this respect, I would like to point out some three very clear and concrete examples of what we are doing. We set up a training center in Erbil in northern Iraq, where we uh, sort of try to bring together journalists, citizen journalists, uh, and train them in transferring, say, the information that they get uh, and to, to, to use basic journalistic skills to, to, to improve the quality of the information so that it can be also used in a wider context. We do the same in Iran, where we know that it's very difficult to get information on Iran out. We uh, try to set up networks of citizen journalists and then again to editing to enhance the journalistic quality to make it more available to mainstream international media. And I, I have to say this is, has significantly improved the access of this kind of information to the international media. And the last example, very, uh, say, very up-to-date, it's very also important and poignant, the situation in Syria. In Syria also we are trying with very difficult circumstances, both inside and outside Syria, to set up this network of citizen journalists to bring the massive information that is coming out, information which is often not so usable for international mainstream media to, to work this up, to check it, to make it into a reliable information that can be used by international media. So I do think for governments, it's like governments like the Dutch government, it's important that you keep up say, the message in the broader sense, but also try to make your hands dirty, get in the mud and, and work on it in concrete projects. Lionel, thank you very much indeed. Um, just before I come to Bill Etchison, um, do we have Christian Meir uh, online at the moment from Reporter Sans Frontier? No? Christian, does he, is he able to comment uh, at all? Yes, yes. Okay. I am. Hopefully we can hear what do he has to me? say. Christian, can you hear me? Uh, Christian, are you there? Uh, can you speak to us? Uh, we're not hearing you. No. Christian, are you? Here? Okay, Christian, it might if you. Take off video and just voice only. Perhaps uh, the, the signal might be better. Can you speak to us? Okay, that doesn't sound so good at the moment. Um, 
Phil Eshison, uh, Google makes a big thing about the importance of freedom of expression. Uh, you, your title is freedom of expression, yeah. but in expressing people, in expressing their opinions, are people uh, understanding, do you think, that they are not necessarily safe in some jurisdictions? Mm. So, this work now? Good. So I feel this subject both personally and, and because of uh, the company I work for. And I think, um, you know, before joining Google, I was a journalist for three decades. And I remember when I started how I had to type my articles out, take the subway, climb seven stairs, give the text to a telex operator who would punch it in for the United States, and then it would be published two days later, or most of my readers would get it three days later. And when Commissioner Kroos was talking about Malala, that touched me because really the internet has revolutionized this. It's given a voice we can all publish directly from here. And it isn't just journalists, as we said. It's everyone who can publish their thoughts. And I think at Google, this was the goal of the company from the very beginning to allow the internet to bring information to everyone and allow everyone to express their voices. And we have a series of platforms that allow this. Um, what we're seeing is a dramatic crackdown on that freedom over time. And it's here visible in Azerbaijan. And we held our big tent uh, to discuss the issues that oppress freedom here. Um, we count now 42 countries that censor, filter, block. Our services are down, blocked, or censored in 30 out of the 150 countries where we operate. And every day, you know, I'll wake up and see a new, award, uh, new warning that uh, YouTube is down in Pakistan or it is down in Indonesia and so forth. Um, so this is the danger that we see and the pressures that we increasingly face. Um, how have we responded? On the issue of anonymity or protection of journalists, um, we believe that we give most of our services and we allow them to be used in an anonymous fashion, and we think that's crucial and has been very, very helpful, both in Gmail and in Blogger or in YouTube, that you, uh, uh, this would give the best type of protection, and, and I think that's an important guarantee to continue. Um, the choices, though, that we face are often very, very difficult, as we're seeing recently with the Innocence of Muslim video. Is that free expression or is that uh, danger? So, I mean, there's no, these are, these are tough and they're getting tougher questions. And I think overall, we, we would err on the side of free expression. The video is back up uh, in the countries where we took it down and where we were, did it without a court order. Um, and we would see that there is a real need to promote free expression. So we're very active in the Freedom Online Coalition. Uh, we're very active in sponsoring uh, awards. We sponsored with UNESCO the World Press Freedom Award, uh, the Netizen of the Year with Reporters Without Borders, and uh, we believe that we, we, we can work together, not always agree. I, uh, Reporters Without Borders will criticize often what we, we do and the choices we make, but that there is a dialogue with the, the press freedom groups and that this is a core value for, for Google and that Google will put full money and its products behind the protection of freedom of expression around the world. So Thank you. Just, just one very quick sure. question before we go, Bill. Although, obviously, you can rightly say anonymity uh, is, the, is the key thing here in order to protect online people, how do you deal with regular attacks on anonymity? Because, of course, with all sorts of software uh, and, indeed, hardware, it's becoming easier to challenge anonymity online. Well, I mean, we're skeptical of complete protection and security. Um, I think the journalists, the bloggers who express themselves have to take the responsibility in the end uh, for their actions. And that, you know, in many cases, this is a key issue that the platform should remain open and free as much as possible. Um, but that, so I'd say two things. One, in the end, the person who publishes is responsible for what they publish and not the platform. You can't attack the postman for delivering a letter. And that's a danger we see that it, increasingly it's easier and inside the European Union to have attacked the postman, us, the platform, than the actual, than go after the people that are 
um, actually writing the material that is considered defamatory or breaks the law. And I think that that, you know, that is a, a key thing. Another way we're trying to protect freedom of expression, and we really could use more help from Europe, is an organization called the Global Network Initiative. Because of all of us faced certain pressures in China, um, and in order to avoid this pressure to um, rush to the bottom and give over as much information on users to governments, uh, Microsoft, Yahoo, and Google got together with civil society, with academics, and created a, a, a NGO called Global Network Initiative to try to work and protect a minimum uh, balance to, to avoid the rush to the bottom. We would really like to make that global and see European companies and Asian companies join us in this. It is two Americans still. Um, so I think that's one thing. And uh, finally, the other thing that we do is we publish a transparency report, a report that shows exactly how many requests we get from governments to hand over information, how many requests we get to take down content. Um, other companies are starting to do this. Twitter has started. Uh, it would be nice if national governments did the same thing and other and European companies as well would, would take up this transparency challenge. Because I think that transparency is something that could lead to concrete, if governments know that they will be noted when they ask for content to be taken down or user information to be handed over, they will be, they will think twice before asking for it. Bill, thank you very much indeed. Uh, do we have Christian or not? Doesn't look like it. I could try again. I'm assuming we don't have Christian remotely. Well, I am here. Um, we are coming to the end Hello. of this first he's, discussion. He's, ah, Christian, you are there. Yeah. I'm here. I yeah, can't hear you. I reason. just wanted, is, is the whole event uh, taking place there in Baku um, is actually an event organized by several European institutions. I would just like to address some issues what we as reporters without borders um, say regarding the European institution. As nearly Chris pointed out and um, all the others, um, the, um, we would like to say that the European Union cannot really credibly promote and protect freedom of expression on the set, if it's on the net, if it's not safeguarded really. Okay, that, that's very... Do you accept, Christian, that there is no such thing, though, as true safety? I mean, that can never be brought about, can it? We'll never know whether he accepts that or not. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> At least we did hear from Christian a little bit there. Um, before, we've got a couple of minutes left for this session. Um, I'd just like to ask whether anybody in our audience would like to say anything. Uh, and if you do, uh, say who you are, who you represent, and keep your comments very short, uh, perhaps 30 seconds, uh, as to what uh, your major point might be. Uh, we'll start here. Yes, gentlemen, there. Now? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Omar Mansour Ansari, and I'm from uh, Afghanistan. Uh, I'm uh, president of the National ICT Alliance of Afghanistan, and new media is uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, the sectors that uh, that includes our association uh, activity and membership. Um, my, uh, I have one comment to make and uh, a question to ask. Um, the comment is about uh, the Google's video that's created a chaos in some of the countries. Uh, I have mentioned this in a session yesterday, but I'd like to mention it again, that the post you have delivered, that has created uh, chaos in some countries. Uh, I agree with you that the postman cannot be punished for what the, uh, the person post with that, but the post uh, company is uh, looking at what is inside the uh, what's uh, what's inside the envelope, right? You cannot post a gun. I, ho I hope you not. Cannot post I hope drugs. I hope not. Because I hope the post company is not looking at my mail. Because uh, uh, that's no, not. No, le <laughs> let me finish. Let me finish. Because that gun and that drug is dangerous for the for some people, and your letter has taken a life of an ambassador. 
and not only that life, but there were many other lives, and it put our economy in danger. Uh, the, the political chaos was created in our okay, country. Okay, right. I, no, no, okay, just so, very, very uh, quickly uh, if you have another one. I, I, think, okay. I think The he other thing is... Very, very quick. Yeah. Uh, sorry? Just very, very quickly because we okay. don't have any time. So. Uh, one, one other issue that's very important. It's not only the insurgents that are a threat to, uh, uh, to the, the, uh, the rights activists, to journalists, but it's government also a threat to, uh, 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 to the journalists. If we are if we are working on a, a, a creating a policy on a global level, we should include and we should be talking about the government. Just an example here in the report: Pakistan, most unsafe country for the journalists. There, there are hundreds. Okay. 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 I, I think there, I'm going to have to stop you. We, honest, we honestly. There, okay. I, we there, get. We get you. We, we, we get your point. If I could just health. stop you there, we get your point. Bill, do you uh, do you want to respond very yeah. quickly to that? Yes. So, yeah. No, I would. I would say that um, I understand. These are often very, very mm -hmm. difficult choices, and when we were faced with it, we did take the um, the video down because exactly that. You cannot s cry fire in 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 a crowded theater. We. I don't. I think it's been questioned whether there was a real and genuine link between the violence and this video, uh, but we we understand and we took it down and, uh, uh, it, because of common sense that way. Um, at the same time, if I know that YouTube is banned entirely, to my knowledge, in Pakistan, that also seems like a disproportionate uh, response to this justified difficult situation. Okay, uh, lady, just there, yes. I think you'll need a microphone, so if we pass it up to you. Yes. No, I still can't hear you. <laughs> it's very... Hello? Yes, good. Okay. Courtney Raj from Freedom House. I run our Global Freedom of Expression program. And a couple of things I wanted to raise. I think that this focus on journalist security is important, but let's not get too caught up in who is and who is not a journalist because we don't want to encourage the accredit, you know, the need to certify who is a journalist and who gets to make that decision. Second, I highly, highly uh, do not agree with that person from Afghanistan who just spoke, and I think it's problematic. I'm hoping he's gonna put his headphones back on that private companies are making decisions to censor and block uh, access to information and that we have to be clear that there are intermediaries that incite violence. It was not a direct video that incited violence and it sends a very negative signal to other governments and to these efforts, for example, on the defamation of religions issue. And I think that we have to be very careful on that. Um, and, and I just wanted to, as my last point, to mention the International Day to End Impunity, which is tied to the uh, anniversary of the Maguindanao massacre in the Philippines and that perhaps that's something where the governments uh, represented here who are interested in raising awareness on this could could raise awareness about that day and bring attention to the issue of security for journalists. Thank okay, you. thank you and I take your point and I agree with it actually about uh, definition of who is and who is not a journalist. I think that's quite important. Uh, lady just there, if you could pass the microphone behind you. Uh, we can't hear you. Sorry, it's... Uh... Thank you very yes. much. My name is Sonia Kelly. Uh, I also work at Freedom House. I uh, run uh, and direct a project called Freedom on the Net, which produces assessments of internet freedom around the world. One of the key issues that we have identified in this year's report is uh, quite relevant to today's discussion, and that is that in 19 out of 47 countries that we examined, uh, journal, online journalists, bloggers, and online users have suffered uh, extreme force, forms of physical violence, including in five countries where at least one journalist, uh, online journalist or a blogger was killed. So I would really like to highlight this issue and also mention that uh, in addition to all of these uh, extreme types of violence, we have noticed in many more settings instances where people get harassed, fired from jobs, denied from universities, because of the things that they had written online. In fact, even in our host country, Azerbaijan, we have interviewed people whose parents 
would actually get threatened to be fired from jobs because of something that the adult ch children wrote on the internet. So this is definitely a huge issue. Uh, I think it's also an issue that can not be divorced from uh, the general concerns regarding freedom and democracy because in many of these settings, uh, it is actually the court system and the rule okay. of law that yep. is a problem. Okay, and that I'll stop you there because we're running out of time, Thank but you. we get your point. Thank you. A uh, gentleman here very quickly. So, uh, we will try and get you a microphone, and then I'll take uh, two more people very quickly after that if this gentleman is quite concise. So. I, I will be as quick as possible. Yeah. My name is Azar Hasret. I'm uh, from Azerbaijan myself, and uh, I represent the Central Asian and Southern Caucasian Freedom of Expression Network. This is uh, an organization just dealing with freedom of expression issues in Central Asia and Southern Caucasus. So just uh, a picture drawn here uh, by uh, some speakers uh, was just uh, totally you know, uh, black in regard, in regard to Azerbaijan. I, I can't share this uh, position because not everything is bad here, you know. There are some uh, positive uh, signs also. So I would like uh, just the uh, speakers, uh, uh, especially my colleague Enula Fatulayev, to speak about uh, positive sides of uh, freedom of expression here also, because the, not everything is black. So thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, very concise. Uh, yes, very quickly, lady here. So. Yep. Yes, no, no. Can you hear me yes. now? Yes. So my name is Khadija Ismailova. I'm a local journalist. I work in with Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. And uh, the one of the concerns is a surveillance. Number of journalists and online activists faced uh, situations when their private emails were shown to them by Ministry of National Security uh, organs. And uh, the Ministry of Communication has a rule, the regulation that they posted on their website uh, that says that all, uh, the, all the communication companies, providers, must allow Minister of National Security uh, to their facilities, should give them full access to their facilities. And many, like all of the providers, allow them to use their facilities and data uh, to surveil and to, for surveillance and uh, actually then using that information against online activists and journalists and users. So how Internet Governance Forum can help, how okay. the international okay. society can help to ho hold accountable governments that use these uh, against online activists. Okay, thank you. And I would say actually that many Western governments, both inside and outside the law, also uh, in the name of anti-terrorism, uh, have a lot of access to communications material as well. So it's not uh, just in uh, in some countries. Uh, we have just, I think, all right, last comment here, and then last, we have to move on to the next yeah, section. I so. will be, can yeah. you hear me? Yes. So please. I will be very short. My name is Emin Milley. I'm a former a prisoner of conscience. And I wrote uh, yesterday a letter to President Aliyev which has been published in Independent, Tagesspiegel, uh, Gazeta Wyborcza, and I know we have some guests here uh, who maybe will meet President. So I would like uh, you to print this letter and to give him personally to make sure that we know that he has read my letter uh, and my opinion about what I think about freedom of Internet in Azerbaijan. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Right, we are going to move on to our next section, which really follows on from some of the things we've heard in the past few minutes, which is about the positive obligations of uh, the governments and supranational bodies to ensure safety of journalists. In other words, what can these organizations do? Uh, I'm going to ask, first of all, uh, Dunya Miotovic to say a few words as a representative on freedom of the media from the OSCE. Dunya. Thank you very much. It's quite difficult to, to speak after so many great speakers and not to repeat what has already been said, but I try um, to do that and I will also try to uh, fill in for Frank, who let me down for the third time since the IGF. I was um, <laughs> planning to speak with him on so many occasions, but um, 
Uh, don't worry, he will have to pay for it sometimes. <laughs> Anyway, um, we speak with the same voice uh, and our values and um, issues that are so dear uh, to all of us uh, is something that uh, no matter if uh, we have speakers from um, the European Commission, uh, Council of Europe, UNESCO or any other international organization including my own um, organization, the organization that I work for, no matter how different the mandates are, no matter how different our roles are, uh, we still all uh, have to uh, comply with our core values uh, related to, to, to human rights. Um, we heard that today an even growing number of the world's citizens are being connected via and through the internet. We are able to get our voices heard all around the world. We also heard this. And governments, but also corporations, are finding it more and more difficult to withhold information and uh, wipe wrongdoing silently under the carpet. Today's interaction of journalists and citizens and the merging of new and traditional media as well as continuously emerging new forms of media, including social media, and we heard about this as well, changing forms of television and broadcasting and aggregating news platforms have led new challenges on how to regulate these new forms on one hand and how to ensure the free flow of information and our right to free expression on the other hand. So in a way we are all still tapping in the dark. There is a gray zone um, and there are governments trying to do certain things for different reasons. Something which however has not changed so much is the way some governments respond to online journalism, bloggers, citizens reporting, making unwanted and embarrassing information available. The crudest form of repression, namely intimidation, threats and violence are not surprisingly also applied to online media actors. The cases of violence against online journalists are increasing as are the cases of arbitrary detention and imprisonment of journalists who are often enough kept behind bars following closed court trials based on trumped up charges, dubious charges, charges of, we heard it from Enula, terrorism, drug dealings, hooliganism, just name it. Last year my office commissioned the first OSC region wide study on internet regulation that also touched upon the issue of safety of online content and interaction um, online. It is available and you can also see the embarrassing trend we see within so-called family of democracies that comprise OSC, so 56 participating states. The study is based on results of a survey designed to reveal the methods used by governments to control access and to use of the internet. I worked closely with Frank LaRue before he published his internet report which also showed this very embarrassing trend when it comes to dealings of certain governments in order to suppress critical voices. I said it many times during this forum but I will also repeat it once again that my office but also many other international organizations are not questioning the legitimate right of any government to fight threats offline and online including terrorism national security issues, child abuse, and all other issues that are so very important for the safety of our societies. But one can't help, can't help, but they get a feeling that underneath it all, governments in power are simply trying to stop, to suppress critical, provocative voices, sometimes tasteless, sometimes vulgar, sometimes touching upon the issues that are so sensitive and painful for our societies, but still those voices should be allowed. So this is what the governments are trying to do as we speak. And this is all happening within the OSC and beyond. Bloggers, social media activists, journalists are put behind bars. And I'm not talking about numbers, I'm talking about real people here. I'm talking about people that I met, Niels met, and many others also in this country only yesterday. Some of them are waiting for their trial, some of 
them are detained for very long periods. And we can also ask ourselves today, because I do not have all the answers. Why are they there? Again, charges are on a completely different grounds. But if you scratch all those laws, if you scratch the reasons behind it, in most of the cases they are sitting there because of the fact that they were provocative and they were critical of the powerful, they criticized the powerful, and they were touching upon corruption in their societies. In my work, in the past three years, I'm often told that I'm meddling in internal affairs when I raise these issues. But I disagree, and I will continue to disagree as long as I'm performing this job. It is in my mandate and in mandate of many other international freedom fighters, if I can call them so, to remind participating states and member states about their commitments and about the need to change the laws in order to stop this embarrassing trend. We all know that we already live in a digital age, a time in which we can create truly democratic cultures with participation by all members of society and in only a few years from now this participation will virtually include most of the world's citizens. I had a meeting with the ITU Secretary General two days ago in order to discuss concerns by the civil society expressed in relation to the engagement and the trend and some critics related to the ITU agenda for Dubai meeting. He assured me and he assured also the civil society that in no way the ITU is going to challenge Article 19. And I believe this is going to happen. So we can also ask ourselves today, why do certain governments try to block, restrict, and filter this flow? Why they are interpreting commitments and obligations in a different way than the countries that are known as the freedom lovers, if I can make so, say so? Um, trying to answer this question since I engage not only in these jobs but also in my previous professional life working in uh, the Balkans, in my home country, in Bosnia and the region. Sometimes I hear it is in order to protect us from um, the issues that I mentioned previously and again I repeat this is legitimate, nobody is challenging this. But the issues that I raise today, and not only me, but also many other speakers, is something that we are witnessing in our work on a daily basis. The second issue I would like to raise briefly is the issue uh, of safety of journalists, safety of bloggers, and safety uh, of uh, citizens reporting. Um, this topic is relevant offline and online for the OSC, for the UN, for all other international organizations. Threats, intimidation, physical violence, including beatings and murder, are almost a weekly affairs. I assume, and this is something that I know, unfortunately, we have to be also very realistic, um, that also in this room, as, as I speak, and as we heard speakers giving their views on, on, on the topic, many of us here do not like dealing with journalists at all and the media in general. Journalists may misquote you, they may provoke you with their questions, they may violate your privacy or just being irritating. Most of us have learned to live with it and we need to have thick skins, so to speak, having realized that this is part of our faith in democracy to have a higher level of tolerance. And this is something that I'm telling authorities here in Azerbaijan. Of course, journalists themselves need to have the responsibility to protect the culture of objectivity and to report accurately, fairly, and in a good faith. But even without being professional in all cases, continuing this embarrassing trend of practice of violence and intimidation against journalists can only take us back to the pastime of fear and repression. There is no other way. It is true that many of us who live in democracies do not always appreciate the importance of our freedoms, including the freedom to speak and to write, until it's too late. So sometimes I think we live, or some of us live in some kind of bubble, and we do not recognize the importance of this extremely 
valuable and important human right. There are positive results, and of course the gentleman was um, speaking just a uh, um, few minutes ago saying it, everything is not black. Of course it is not black, but in order to, to make it a bit lighter, there is a need for certain governments to, to move and to change some things, to stop once again the embarrassing trends. Everyone is talking about the image of certain countries. Everyone is saying that certain countries you know, should not be performed or put in a, in a very negative light. But you cannot do that. You can simply do not, you do not have a possibility to say so if you know that there are people in prison for the work they were doing or for a certain articles or posts on a Facebook sitting in prison. For me, this is quite difficult. And I know that there is an understanding also by under, uh, Azerbaijani government, because we are here, this is a host country, that they need to do some changes. And of course, they can do it with the help of different international organizations. And what I really welcome is the open door policy. And uh, they will to engage with different international organizations in order to, to, to change this uh, uh, negative trend in relation to free speech. I will try to close by mentioning a um, few more issues that I think are quite important. And those are issues happening within um, UN um, Human Rights Council, like the adoption of the UN Human Rights Council resolution on the promotion, protection, and enjoyment of human rights on the internet, and also a resolution on uh, uh, safety of journalists. I use this opportunity once again to congratulate Austrian and Swedish government for starting this process. These two documents are very important for all international organizations and continue our work in relation to human rights and in relation to freedom of speech around the world. We will all have some path before us until we we'll see commendable progress here, and the only way to speed up this process is to remain engaged, to keep raising awareness, and to have the like-minded join forces, just as we are doing here and now. Defending and protecting those who exercise human rights and their right to free expression offline and online is a continuous uphill struggle. It is only together that we will be at least sometimes successful. Thank you very much. Sonia, thank you very much indeed. Um, Sabine Verheyen from the Member of the European Parliament. Uh, we, we've heard a lot about implementation of laws today, uh, but it's very difficult, isn't it, if states do not want to live up to international norms or not really very interested in what the international community thinks about them, or indeed states who turn around and say we have the laws. Yeah, to have the laws is, is one side. Uh, but to, to respect the own law you gave yourself and to, to work on it correctly and to implement it correctly is sometimes the other side. We have cases where we have excellent law, uh, but the government doesn't respect it themselves, or institutions or agencies or even hired persons uh, uh, don't, don't respect that what is law. And uh, that's, that's the reason why we have many problems in some countries uh, and uh, where it is sometimes very easy, or, uh, very difficult also for other uh, countries or, for example, the EU to have an impact on what's going on in some countries or not. Because if there is correct law, but the implementation is not correct, you, it's, it's, it's not respecting law and that's uh, difficult to, 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 to uh, work against uh, by an uh, um, international community. We just can put our finger always into the wound and t uh, uh, say what's going on there. We can make it remarkable, we can make it uh, uh, visible, and we can talk about and we have to implement it also in our negotiations in other political issues. If we have, for example, neighborhood policies, if, if we have a policy of uh, um, uh, coming closer to the European Union, candidates coming, uh, want to come, want to enter the European Union, and also international treaties, there the freedom of speech and the respect of freedom of speech and uh, to, to in, in ensure and empower this all uh, is always part of our discussions we have on the European level. 
uh, but also inside the European Union we have always to be careful that the standards we want to have are respected. So uh, one of the main issues we have to discuss during the next uh, years and uh, where we have to keep an eye on uh, is the uh, question of media pluralism, for example. Freedom of press alone is not enough to provide uh, a free information, a free flow and free speech. Um, states have to proactively fight media monopolies. If true media pluralism is not given, journalists are hindered to actually pronounce the news. They have researched that it be because of corporate issues or economical pressure. Media should be plural for the purpose of enhancing a vast range of information and views at different topics, giving the opportunity to find the best way a society wants to develop. Uh, the internet gives, on the one hand, the opportunity for this plural development in a very special way by lowering the barriers when it comes to publishing journalistic works. On the other hand, this is only the case if the medium itself remains egalitarian, open to all, and free of censorship, and in other words, neutral. And there also for us, there are challenges in the discussions we are leading or we are uh, having the next, the next month. Uh, for example, how shall the internet shall be governed in future? Is there a special uh, uh, responsibility on uh, uh, network providers, on intermediaries? How uh, is the role they play also in the in a new media surrounding and for freedom of, of speech. We heard about the example of Google taking out uh, of, of YouTube uh, special videos. You can have different positions on that. What's freedom of speech? To say everything, uh, to, to, to say things you like or you to, to accept it. And there is also a big responsibility on these actors in this playing field. And we have a question sometimes also to answer how many power we give to governments uh, having an impact on such companies, on service providers, on uh, telecommunication providers, because that is also a basis of uh, uh, freedom of speech and uh, being, being also sure. How, what impact do we have in future or does governments have to get information out of these uh, companies? We heard the examples and that are questions we also have to deal with on the governmental side, also in the European Union. Uh, we have to, to talk about um, uh, the proactive fight against media monopolies. We have to talk well about uh, how to control this and how to control the, the, the structures of medias in a country, uh, also inside the European Union. Only by controlling the media structures in a country, uh, the hindrance to uh, media pluralism can be detected. It is therefore crucial to determine the scope of action media authorities are qualified to carry out. A clear answer is not given until today, so we have to work on this also in, on the European side. Still, there should be clear limits as to the protection of journalists and their work, especially the confidentiality of sources. In the creation process of journalistic work, free from interference should be a minimum requirement. We talk about genuine free press. Uh, there are many singular skills and, and, and kits, uh, uh, tools we have to, to improve even in the European Union, if it's respected everywhere, and we have to, to, to uh, export it also via our uh, discussions, via our treaties and negotiations uh, to other areas. Uh, and what we have also uh, uh, in Europe is the responsibility to show where our th things are going wrong and where not. And not just outside, but also inside the European Union. And Nelly Cruz knows that we had to, uh, to improve uh, legislation also in the European Union if it's uh, comparable and competi uh, compatible to uh, European fundamental rights and European law. And I think uh, we have to, to be very careful that in a surrounding where freedom of speech should be yeah, as usable as drinking and eating and, and as, as normal as drinking and eating, these values are not laid down that we don't respect it anymore because we are used to it, to have it uh, for grant, and we have to work on it also in future, also on the European level. So, Sabine, thank you very much. And I would uh, draw attention, I think, to Voltaire at that point. I may not like what you say, but I defend your right to say it. And I think that's one of the issues, isn't it, about how far you take that quote. 
in the in the context of the issue that we're discussing today. Um, Johan Hallenborg is uh, from the Swedish government, uh, and I'd like him perhaps to say a few words now. As Sweden has clearly been very very uh, evident on this issue, as we were hearing from Dunja. Oh. Can't hear. You. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, yes, it is. It is quite correct. We've been been active on this issue for a while now. It's a, it's a priority in our foreign policy to work for what is broadly called broadly called internet freedom, <coughs> but basically protecting and promoting freedom of expression and other human rights in the internet environment. Um, I'd like very much to agree with what uh, my, my colleague Lionel from Netherlands said. It's important to connect different strategies and different ways of working here. What we do in foreign policy needs to be complemented what we're doing in development cooperation, for example. And let me give you an example. Uh, our, our agency for development cooperation, CEDA, um, is, is very, very effectively complementing this work by providing a lot of support to freedom on the net activists, etc. Yeah. Um, they recently had a, a large call for proposals. And just to give you a, a hint of, of the attention this is getting, they got 950 proposals for support. And they do have a substantial amount of money, but uh, imagine the interest that goes into these issues of freedom of expression online. States do have a responsibility to act proactively. We do that through our development cooperation but also foreign policy. We need to show support where human rights are in danger, where freedom of expression is violated. This is another important part that we're doing. The third leg in this work needs to be on the trade side. This is where we are working on, on the trade policy issues, working to establish a stronger dialogue with companies on appropriate behavior and working according to frameworks and guidelines in countries that they're active in. The Global Network Initiative is one, one example of that. And I don't know also now the industry dialogue with the big telecoms is another one that we are, um, we are actively promoting and, 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 and uh, yeah, promoting. We don't need any new human rights standards. This is our, this is our starting point. But we ne do need to get a better understanding of how these are implemented in the internet environment. In this work, um, organizations such as the Council of Europe plays an important role, the OSCE as well, and we are quite active in both of them in trying to push the internet freedom agenda. We're also happy to see UNESCO being much more active, and we do also play a facilitating role in UNESCO in, in these issues. And perhaps as a, as a proposal to, to Guy on his earlier question is to link up UNESCO's work a little bit closer with what's going on in the Human Rights Council, um, which Dunja uh, reflected on. And this is also something that I would like to highlight. The resolution on the enjoyment uh, of human rights on the internet was adopted in July this year. It was a groundbreaking resolution where states universally affirmed that human rights apply equally on the internet as well as offline. Um, the resolution was adopted without a vote by consensus, meaning that there is virtually a, a universal backing of these principles, and this is important. Our challenge now is to bring this resolution into other parts of internet policy making, of course, such as the IGF. The other resolution which is important is protection of journalists. In that text, there is clear reference to online journalism and online media activities. So there is already a link between those two resolutions. I'd like to also to give the support to our friends from Freedom House when they said uh, it's important not to label journalists. Um, I do have a great respect for journalistic profession, but I do it's, it's sometimes dangerous to, to require that journalists be labeled and put in particular compartments. Uh, the protection of freedom of expression applies to all and it's equally important online as well as offline. So these are some of the starting points from, for, for our work. And uh, may I just um, end by giving a little bit of a commercial. Uh, my minister, Bilt, is uh, producing in, in this book uh, an article which is, uh, which is called 
um, the fight for freedom online, internet freedom, is the new frontier for freedom in the world. So um, to get a little bit more understanding of, of Swedish policy in our work, um, I would advise you to, to read this one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johan. In fact, your minister is one of the more active ones as well on Twitter, I notice, as I, as I follow him uh, quite often. So he certainly believes in that freedom. Um, we have very little time left. I'd like to ask uh, Yanis Karklins, the Assistant Director General for Communication and Information at UNESCO, perhaps to sum up a little bit of uh, where we are after our debate this morning. Then after that, I'll just list a few action points that I think have come out of this this morning. So. So now you hear me? Okay. Uh, one, uh, one first thing which, uh, as a sum up, I can say that uh, all of us here around the table and all speakers uh, were already converted. And uh, it would be a very useful uh, time to time to speak to those who are not converted yet. Uh, that is the first uh, conclusion. Second uh, conclusion is that um, Part of the problem we're addressing uh, is uh, in because of the attempt to apply our uh, previous experience and previous knowledge uh, to the uh, new situation uh, and changing environment in media. And we need to really step, step back and, and uh, think uh, creatively uh, uh, to ensure uh, these, that these freedoms are permanent and uh, that people feel much um, easier with them. And I'm, I'm using the uh, term uh, people, and I would maybe uh, need, to, need to say politicians, because when we're talking about uh, governments, not necessarily governments, but politicians uh, sometimes react or overreact to um, uh, new media and threats that new media uh, represent. We had uh, examples of uh, riots riots in United King Kingdom and the first reaction of the government was oh no we need to, to, to crack down on, on new media because they are uh, helping those uh, 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 people who do unrest uh, uh, in, in their tasks. Uh, thanks God there was a pu public opinion and, and that uh, turned around immediately the, uh, the position, initial position of, of the government and things uh, stood in the right place. Uh, the, t the target audience certainly uh, are governments, and we need to uh, work with governments uh, as much as we can and use every uh, occasion to reiterate the importance uh, of uh, freedom of expression and freedom of press, and uh, in reality to promote uh, what I would say uh, the culture of safety of journalists, because uh, it is not necessarily present yet, even in the among the, the uh, governments which uh, we consider as uh, uh, democratic. I had recently one, um, we, we had recently at UNESCO one event where um, ambassador of one country said, you know, we're not killing any more journalists as government. And what do you want from us? Uh, but the, the journalists are killed by um, uh, organized crime groups in that country. So uh, the culture of safety of journalists is still not present, and we need to uh, work with governments uh, in order to, in to install it. Answering uh, maybe the uh, question or, or encouragement uh, of um, representative government of Sweden, I would like to say that UNESCO is uh, uh, trying to work with the Office of High Commissioner uh, by submitting on a regular basis information to the Universal Periodic Review. And this is the uh, way how we feel UNESCO could uh, contribute to the promotion of um, uh, freedom of expression and freedom of press, uh, which uh, where we have very specific task uh, in UNESCO. We're not working with the freedom of expression per se, but we're working with med uh, freedom of expression of media, including new media. So I, I think that this is an ongoing uh, dialogue. We need to uh, be persistent because this will never end. And uh, as uh, in the one of the previous workshops today, uh, somebody said the um, uh, thing what we 
or our understanding what we developed five years ago today is not applicable simply because of technological evolution. And this is we're condemned to uh, revisit our understanding uh, time again uh, uh, as technology evolves. So I'll stop here and thank you very much for uh, inviting us to, uh, to this discussion. Yanis, thank you very much indeed. I notice the room is clearly uh, people are anxious to get off to their lunch. Um, I'm not going to take any more comments from the floor. Let me just sum up then very quickly where I think we stand in terms of action points. There was clearly a desire today to see more training, uh, I think, for online actors. Uh, and that's something that Western organizations, international organizations, Western governments can do. Uh, there was a desire to see more implementation of the law. Uh, and indeed for international organizations, we heard it from the European Union uh, in many guises, to use whatever leverage they have uh, on countries which aspire to get closer to the European Union or to become members of the European Union or to have trade agreements with the European Union to use whatever leverage is possible to try to get better implementation of the law. There's a desire to make sure that protection of anonymity uh, remains the absolute priority uh, and that uh, IPP, uh, that service providers uh, should understand that and should go as far as possible to do that. Uh, and there is a desire, I think, to understand that this is not about new legislation uh, which is required, but actually the human rights that are applicable offline are also the ones that are applicable online. Uh, and uh, people involved in this sector should understand that. These are all things that I think from today we can feed in to uh, the main session tomorrow on openness. Uh, the results of this workshop will be fed into that. Um, thank you very much for everyone taking part. Apologies to those I didn't have time to call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was a good debate. Could have gone for another two hours. <laughs>